a whole new kind of hearty soup. New Lipton vegetable with big slices of fresh tasting vegetables. In fact, in taste tests, most Campbell users themselves prefer new Lipton vegetable. Try it yourself. Then you'll understand why our new flash isn't just another flash in the pan. Cleaning your oven can be like a jail cell. How long have you been in? Ten years scouring and scraping. Ten years of fumes, mess. This is marriage? Break out tonight with Mr. Muscle, the self-scouring oven cleaner that works overnight while you sleep. No scouring. Mr. Muscle penetrates grease. No scraping, no scrubbing. Mr. Muscle lifts off baked on grime. Smells clean. Mr. Muscle, you're a good man to wake up to. Webster is next on BCTV. <laughs> Good morning. Two young telephone workers in Prince George have got themselves in a bit of a jackpot this morning. When they thought the negotiations had broken down over the weekend, they moved in and barricaded themselves in the fifth floor of the Prince George telephone business building last night at 9 o'clock with food and supplies, threatening to cut off up to 20,000 telephones due to what they feel is a breakdown in negotiations. A very tricky situation indeed. And the telephone company and the telephone union is watching it and trying to deal with it with some anxiety. Earlier this morning, Giselle Portenier of the BCTV News Hour spoke to the two boys, in two men they are, Peter Massey and Don Garden, they are 26 and 38 years of age, in the telephone company barricaded rack room in Prince George. And here is what they had to say to Giselle this morning at about half past seven o'clock and I'll give you some more later as soon as you've seen this interview with Giselle and the two telephone company men. Here's how it went this morning. Good morning. Morning. How are you today? It was fine. How long have you been barricaded in that room now? Well, we've been barricaded in since 9 p.m. last night and uh, the union at this point, they had no prior knowledge to what we were doing so we got a hold of them this morning and they say we should not make any statements as to what is going on. The only thing we can do is read over a statement that we prepared. Okay, go ahead. What is that statement? Our action is a direct response to the recent breakdown of negotiations between BCTEL and the TWU. Eleven months of restraint by workers and Gordon McFarland, chairman of the board of BCTEL, issued a statement that finally he was willing to sit down and negotiate realistically. So much for realism. Hopes of of a settlement so long in coming were dashed Friday. Labor actions escalated, and the possibility of a full-scale walkout became uncomfortably real. To the public, this was, seemed to be just another labor dispute. For those involved, it is a matter of frustration, anger, and bitterness at being unable to effect a reasonable change in company attitudes. This may well turn out to be one of the most bitterly fought disputes in BC history. We believe our actions will force the company and the union to re resume talks with the spirit of compromise. Our hope is that we can avoid the destruction and violence that will surely come if workers do not see substantial progress in contract negotiations. We do not condone damage to private and public property and will not destroy any company equipment while on the premises. We will, however, close down or attempt to close down 50% of Prince George's residential phones and all business phones. Essential services will be maintained. We're sorry for the inconvenience, but this can be the only reasonable way to end this dispute. Uh, you say that you are not going to damage any of the company's equipment, but you have booby-trapped one of the uh, one of the doors. Is that right? Can you tell me about that? Um, we can't go into that. Uh, as for that statement that was made by us, so you know we have to. Uh, How much food do you have? How long can you stay in there? We can't. We're not allowed to divulge that either, unfortunately. Um, has anybody tried to get you out of there yet? No. Okay. Thanks very much for talking with us. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. bye. 
I'm going to continue with the telephone company report right now. I had planned to do it another way. But uh, shortly after that, I tried to talk to Messrs. Massey and Gordon, and they were not then prepared to talk. I don't think they've been officially shut up, but I think the union officials are very delicate about this thing, which is potentially a breach of the criminal code. This morning, however, a little after Giselle spoke to uh, Peter Massey in the rack room at Prince George, I got hold of Gordon McFarlane, the chairman of the BC Telephone Company, and he was prepared to make a statement to me, which he did in answer to my questions, and which you will now see in about four seconds' time. McFarlane talking to Webster. Mr. McFarlane. Good morning, Jack. What are you going to do about this messy situation in Prince George with these two guys barricaded in on some kind of sit-in in the rack room? Well, obviously we can't tolerate it, Jack. It's very unfortunate that uh, they have taken such an irresponsible course of action, which uh, we will not be able to tolerate, uh, and uh, we are going to have to, to move quite rapidly to, uh, to get them out of there. Is this potentially a criminal offense, Mr. McFarlane? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, their actions are... are strictly illegal. Uh, do you accept the union statement on the face of it that they have nothing to do with it and that these two men are acting on their own? Oh yes, I, uh, certainly I, I would have uh, no uh, doubts about that at all. Uh, I don't think the union would uh, participate in such an e illegal act. I think in fact that these two fellows are mad at the union as well as mad at the company. Um, do you, have you any reports on any number of phones being pulled out of service? In no, I haven't at the moment. In fact, uh, uh, as best as I can determine, uh, these fellows really don't know quite what they're doing, and uh, so they may not know, in fact, whether they are actually uh, disconnecting uh, essential telephones or... Can you tell me this? What is a rack room, Mr. McFarlane? That is the portion of the office where outside cables terminate and cross-connect into the switching system. So therefore, they could, if they know what they're doing, they could seriously affect and cut off all of the communications in that area. They could uh, do that uh, even if they didn't know what they were doing. Yeah, I know what you mean. As far as the booby tap is concerned, surely they're not serious that uh, they would damage the equipment if anybody tried to get in. Well, if they do, then of course, uh, then their actions would be even more serious. They could do something that, uh, that could have caused uh, something to occur. Okay, one, two last questions. Negotiations, did they not break down on Friday? No, they didn't. Uh, uh, Mr. Collins is still involved in the negotiations. Uh, uh, some proposals were put forward. Uh, obviously, there wasn't harmony, uh, total harmony, but uh, uh, they're, they're, the negotiations haven't broken down. The union... Uh, uh, indicated disappointment. You saw what uh, was said, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, Mr. Collins is still involved, and there, there is no reason why the negotiations cannot continue. Question. Have you contacted uh, uh, the police in Prince George to take action? They have been contacted. Do you expect the police to take action today? I expect action will be taken very, very soon. Thank you, Gordon McFarlane. Much obliged. Thank you. Bye, bye just now. Bye just now. There you are. Gordon McFarlane, president of the BC Tell, has been in touch with the police and he expects action, draw your own conclusions, very shortly today. Since then, we've talked to the police at Prince George and the local uh, sergeant there is still regarding this as a labor dispute matter and it's just a couple of guys who've locked themselves into a room. Uh, but the reason that Massey and Gordon wouldn't talk to me this morning was because they'd got some phone calls from local officials. And Massey and Gordon uh, feel that their action has already started local negotiations going again. I don't see how local negotiations in Prince George can affect the difficulties between the Telephone Workers Union and uh, the people themselves. But however, it's quite obvious that the union officials are very concerned about this particular turn, which is not under their control, in what can be a very delicate situation, especially with McFarland saying that he expects action from the police very soon and today. Hopefully we'll hear from Bill Clark of the Telephone Workers Union when he comes out of an emergency union meeting at headquarters in Vancouver this morning. I can't tell you how many phones, in fact, if any, have been cut off yet.
The plan is to cut off all the business phones and 50% of the residential phones, although Massey and Gordon have said that they can they look after essential services, although how the devil they can look after essential services if half the phones in Prince George should be cut off and people can't call the fire, the police and ambulance, is something which they may not have uh, worked out in their own minds. So we'll cover that as a moving story this morning. I have a special guest this morning by the name of Sir John Ford, who is United Kingdom High Commissioner in Ottawa. And I don't know if he's come out here to berate me about what I said about British Airways. Not likely. Uh, more likely we'll have a fairly serious discussion about the state of affairs in the United Kingdom. And I shall try not to mention the British North America Act and the British House of Commons. Later in the program, a very delicate story. Uh, Michel remembers. It uh, says on the cover, the story of a year-long contest between innocence and evil. And it all happened, according to the authors of the book, include, who include uh, Dr. Lawrence Pazder, MD, a psychiatrist, and Michelle herself, Michelle Smith, about a fight with evil. That'll be a dicey one, but you might find it intriguing. Anyway, Sir John Ford, UK High Commissioner, and any telephone company bulletins after the break. Sir John Ford is the High Commissioner, the UK High Commissioner. Still the same title, Sir John, isn't it? Still the same, yes. Tell me, after we change the Constitution and we get our technical independence, which we've had for many years anyway, will you become an ambassador instead of a High Commissioner to Canada? No, I shall remain exactly the same High Commissioner because the Queen will still remain Queen of Canada. And as long as the Queen is Queen of Canada, she can't appoint an ambassador to herself. So she can only appoint a High Commissioner to herself? No, Mrs. Thatcher appoints the, the High Commissioner to uh, the Prime Minister of Canada. I suppose the Queen technically appoints them. Well, the Queen approves, yes, but technically speaking, I represent the uh, British government and not the head of state, as I did, for example, in uh, Jakarta, where I was ambassador, and I represented the Queen to the President of Indonesia. A very fine point. It is. It's an important point. We're still getting chilling tolls about, chilling tales about a recession in Britain and an inflation rate which is possibly fearsome, is it not? Well, it is fearsome, but uh, the trend is downwards. I, by at the present rate, it's gone down now to just below 16%, 15.9%, uh, but it was 21 and over 21% a short while ago, so the trend is down. But it is a horrible story, this inflation, with a very high bank rate, and you've got uh, also uh, the very high currency rate, so British industry is being hit by three things at the same time. Well, I was in Britain for two or three weeks, three weeks of this summer, and what always astonishes me is with the two million un unemployed. Yes, rather over that now. Two million unemployed, and yet you see nothing in the main, as a kind of semi-tourist, but prosperity. But I How think, do people do it in Britain? But I think uh, it's a part of the story is this phenomenon of the new black economy, the people who moonlight and don't pay tax and don't reveal what they're doing. Oh, you don't mean black blacks. You black, mean black. You don't mean blacks. No, I mean, well, you call it black market. It's in that sense, uh, which... A black uh, market yeah, economy. In labor, yeah, which is basically now, one of our bankers a short while ago said that he thought that 15% of British gross national product was now represented by activities, uh, by plumbers and electricians and 101 other different activities, where the uh, tax is not paid, where the payment is in cash, where the person doesn't declare it, and where he does a job which doesn't appear in the statistics. Now, it may not be as high as 15%, it might be as low as 5%, but that represents an enormous amount of economic activity which doesn't show up. When I see this prosperity, which I think is very obvious, I think this may be part of the reason. In other words, the economy is on... The, many people of all levels of society, I presume, are on the fiddle. Yes. If you want something done, as I found when I was in Scotland this summer, you've got to be prepared to pay it in cash. I think that is true. In, uh, well, isn't that a, a collapse of British-type morality? I think it is. I think it's an effect of high taxation over a long period, which has caused people to try and evade taxation. And it is a phenomenon of modern times. I think you've got it here too, for example. A lot of people moonlight. I suspect, for example, that in both countries, people moonlight when they're on 
public assistance or unemployment pay and don't declare the fact that they're doing it. Far be it from me to admit anything of that nature in this country, but you are absolutely totally right. If you want a house built here, you can get it built by a union man after hours for non-union rates uh, in cash, bits and pieces here and there. Can it be stopped in our kind of society? Or will, when it becomes true unemployment and depression, will then people's consciences either or can a government crack down? I doubt if a government nowadays can crack down. I think we may have got ourselves into a, a position where we can't get out of at all easy. My own feeling is that ultimately what one's got to do is to alter one's taxation and to make the taxation as far as you can, a taxation on purchasing, because uh, if you are buying stuff which is taxed in the shops and everyone has to buy, you pay your tax with uh, sort of, uh, luxury things and that sort of thing tax proportionately But higher. isn't the true problem the level of social services, whereby everybody now expects total social services on almost every occasion, and I'm not talking about the underprivileged, I'm talking about those who have two incomes in the family and lots of money one way or another. But they still want the government to do every single thing for them. I think this is certainly a contributory factor in both countries. Both countries? Yeah. You might be a little worse than we are, but I don't think you're that worse, much worse than we are. In some ways, I would think some of your benefits are higher than ours, and therefore you may have a bigger problem than ours. Well, I thought you were the leaders. Uh, certainly, and you, you were the people who led the field in this extraordinary thing from which you will benefit, of course. The unlimited index pension. Yes. Which I, I, is, is a, an extraordinary phenomenon. Is there any sign in Britain uh, that have been weak signs from time to time in this country about attempting to cap the unlimited indexing of bureaucrats' pensions? Is there any move towards that by Thatcher? Well, she's getting uh, a, a quite interested in the whole business of public sector pay, and it's all being examined at the moment. And uh, my guess is that uh, what is going to happen is they're going to look very closely at the actual cost of the index pension and uh, then say, right, O oh public servants, if, you're, if the figures show that you're not contributing enough to your index pension, then you should have relatively a lower rate of pay. It's just uh, not uh, fair no. to the average guy who doesn't have an index pension and but, who doesn't but, work for the state. Uh, but of course, the, the real thing is, which I think is terribly important, is that what is the real uh, trouble is allowing inflation. I mean, the politicians uh, allow inflation to mag become more and more, and this makes the index pension valuable. If you think it in Britain, from I think about 1750 to 1930, there was never a, a, a value of the pound below 60 on the index of 100, and never above 150 in approximately 200 years. One can realize then that the issue of, of, of indexed pensions just wouldn't have arisen. Oh. Sir John Ford, UK High Commissioner. Remarkably frank, these UK High Commissioners, they always surprise me. Uh, after the break. In as relaxed a fashion as I can. Sir John Ford is a UK High Commissioner. Oh, it's easy to be heavy, but let's be light. My brother and I walked into the Savoy Bar, a place I don't normally frequent. And he had a gin and tonic, and I had a very small gin, lime, and soda. Do you know what the bill was? Well, I can imagine it might be three pounds. Four pounds and five P. You see how ignorant I am. I don't move in those circles. I can't afford to. You, you <laughs> just don't go into the Savoy. I would never dream of going to Savoy, no. Well, we used to go to the Savoy when we were on Fleet Street, you know, mm -hmm. stand around a fancy bar there. But then we went from there to the National Arts Centre in Battersea. Is that what you call it? Oh, the, 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 the old Herbert Morrison uh, Pleasure Centre. Uh, I wouldn't say it was just a pleasure centre, but they do serve very good meals. And mm -hmm. we had an excellent lunch for... I don't forget if it was the one of us or the two of us. I think the two of us with a glass of wine each was just over five pounds. Well, I think if you've gone into the provinces, you'll probably got it for three pounds if you're going to the right place. There's a tremendous difference in the prices between the what I call the, the top-notch hotels and the, the places of lesser. You must place. be frightening the tourists away. I paid for breakfast one morning on the Cavendish, and it was one scrambled eggs and sausage, and one croissant and coffee. And the damn thing came to nine pound and fifty p, nine three twenty seven, twenty five dollars. And the Cavendish isn't what you call a five star hotel, is I'm, it? No, I'm horrified at that price. 
Yeah. Well, next time, Jack, don't stay in London. Go to uh, round the country and uh, uh, visit some, go, or even go up to so your lovely Scotland and the right sunny areas and visit bed and breakfast places and you'll come away with 10 bucks a night or 15 bucks a night for bed and a jolly good Scottish breakfast with good oatmeal. oatmeal. You're still an oatmeal eater, I gather, because they tell me you're still the oatmeal savage. Is that right? That's as true. As well? I accept that. The oatmeal is very good for you. I wish you hadn't mentioned Glasgow, though. Now, I gather you went up there rather uh, sad at the changes there. Uh, you know, I've seen cities in Europe that were bombed heavily, which Glasgow was not, which looked better than the abomination that turned out in Glasgow. But what really objected to me, me were the obscenities in the buses, three feet high, and nobody cared. What's yep. happened? Well, I, this is a, a phenomenon which is terribly worrying, I think, if you go into the public lavatories, for example, I and mean, the graffiti on the walls and the graffiti in the... It's just like in the parts of uh, Britain. It's Glasgow, like of like course, is one of your really depressed areas, yeah. is it not? It is, yeah. How's the oil business doing now? Oh, no, in Tremendously well. I mean, there we're, we're, of course, looking you in the eye here. Are we thinking now, you Canadians, why can't you have a sensible oil policy? We're, we're now exporting oil. In fact, this last two months, we produced 7 million barrels more than we used, and we've got enough coal for 300 years, and we've got enough gas indefinitely, and we charge ourselves the full world price, whereas you Canadians charge yourselves half, under half the world price. We think this is a very bad thing indeed, because it subsidizes your exports to Europe and makes your petrochemicals unfairly competitive, and we think too it's causing your government an intolerable budgetary position. And that's why you're paying three pounds, is it, a gallon for petrol in the United Kingdom? Oh, no, not quite three pounds. It's uh, one pound thirty, oh, I think, which is three dollars. Three dollars, I'm sorry. Yes. But was this a deliberate policy decision by the British Absolutely, government yes. to charge the full economic yes. cost yes. within Britain within Britain for all of its... Uh, yes. And in fact, Mrs. Thatcher has got under considerable attack from British industry because she is uh, persuading the nationalised uh, electricity and gas councils to charge the full price for energy that they produce so that the gas council is, is, pr is producing terrific profits out of North Sea gas at the full price. Uh, An industry says, well, it ought to get it cheaper, like other industries, but the government is standing pat on this. But this seems to be a kind of contradiction in terms. A British pound the other day to buy it here cost $2.84. Yep. Right? And that obviously puts your exports at a considerable disadvantage. It does indeed. So where's the benefit of well, not subsidizing uh, for industry at least the use of gas or other basic fuels for your exports? Well, the, the argument f for this is that ultimately your industry stands on its competitivity. And the thing that the world has seen is that after the first oil price increase in the early 70s, the Japanese applied it at once, and the Japanese industry was the most vulnerable in the world, probably, to this particular thing. And they immediately took the measures necessary to become competitive in the new circumstances. In effic efficient. Efficient. Efficiently competitive. So you and they are now extremely competitive and have taken the change, and Japan has overcome that difficulty. Now, you we believe that if you subsidize and you don't let your industry face up to the real forces of competition, in the long run, you will do worse than you do if you make them competitive from the very outset. And this is what the Thatcher belief is. That's a real old Tory view, isn't it? Well, I don't know if it's about a Tory view. It's, uh, it's certainly a view, I think, based on the fact of Japan, which ought to make all of us worry very much about the sort of things we have been doing. Now, do your Nazi oil fields make you now totally self-sufficient, or do you still get oil from the Gulf? Well, we, what we do in England, we buy certain types of oil, specialized types in various parts of the world, Nigeria, the Gulf, etc. But we are in fact self-sufficient. And then we sell rather more of our oil of a different type in order to make up the balance. But we can operate uh, autarkically if we want to. Mind you, with two million unemployed on the face of it right now, if you keep the pressure up on British industry, and one has only to look at the collapse of your automobile industry mm -hmm. in this market, you could finish up with four million unemployed before you become efficient and modernized in your plants. Well, I think nobody is thinking in those terms at all. The worst that has been thought of at the moment is three million. My own feeling is the figures are totally erroneous nowadays for the reason of the black market that I mentioned earlier on. That an awful lot of people are in fact earning who are nominally unemployed. And this is I evidenced in the prosperity in England. But undoubtedly, I mean, if you look at the, tac uh, the strike record, in, the, in last September, we had fewer strikes in Britain than we had since 1945. Is this so? is a remarkable change in statistics, uh, and uh, 
there is an undoubted desire of uh, the labor force now to look at productivity deals and uh, changes in methods, etc., which wasn't there before. And it may be and, uh, uh, that there is a very strong evidence to show that perhaps the Thatcher medicine, horrid though it is and uncomfortable though it is, may work quicker than people now think. I don't know if I can really ask you political questions, but I will anyway. Was Callaghan's uh, retirement, he's been off and on for years, was it really unexpected? No, it was not unexpected, and it was very much wanted by the Labour right wing because they saw that uh, he had lost control of the party, and this was very obvious in the Labour Party convention. And uh, if he had stayed on, it would have enabled the left wing of the Labour Party to change the rules about the election of the leader. Ah, explain that to me. Explain that to me, because on, on the left you've got... Uh, Anthony Wedgwood, Wedgwood Dan, then, yes. who's an extremist from a point of view of the Labour Party. Indeed, yes. And on the right, is it Jenkins? Well, the main... No, because Jenkins is no longer in Parliament. He's still a European oh, commissioner. Oh, he's the big Healy at the moment is the right wing. And what was the change that the left wing uh, wanted to do? The left wing... Uh, hitherto, the party leader has been elected by the parliamentary party, and it's the MPs in Parliament who elect their leader, which is a very logical arrangement. What the left wing want is for the party... Uh, constituency groups to have, I think it's a 30% say in the election, for the trade unions to have a 30% say in the elections, and the parliamentary party to have a 40% say. Oh, I see. And uh, they know that uh, the, union, they, they, the left wing has got the full backing of the constituencies, and it's got the backing of some of the major unions. So in that way, they could foist a left wing leader on the parliamentary deputies whom the parliamentary deputies would not agree on their own. And the importance of Callaghan's uh, resignation is that it does give the parliamentary party an opportunity to elect a leader now who will then be their leader for the indefinite future. So that if the uh, next special party conference to be held in January to work out the machinery for election would in fact be stymied somewhat. Yeah, keep Wedgwood Ben out. Makes sense. Uh, he would have rather have it run kind of like a TUC election where you've got weighted numbers right. yeah. than by those elected to the House of Commons picking their own leader, That's it. which is the traditional way in Britain. Indeed. Mind you, here we have party conventions and elect leaders by local delegates. You don't have that. No, not in the same way, no. You're lucky. After the break with Sir John Ford. <laughs> Maybe something happening in the telephone strike. I'm just trying to get Gordon McFarlane, the president of BC Tel, not telephone strike, in the situation in the Prince George rack room. But in the meantime, while we're lining that up, I don't know whether to stall, pass my time, throw away my cigarette, or, or talk to Sir John Ford. You don't mind waiting a second, Sir John, do you? Is Gordon there? Hopefully in a moment. Yeah, let me know as soon as he's there. We'll just talk about the weather. Yeah, yeah. Live in Ottawa, old chap? Yeah. Well, I'm with uh, Marguerite, we're well, staying with Marguerite Ford, your alderman. You your know, sister my sister in law, in -law yes. You so picked quite a bright alderman. She's a very bright alderman, I think. Well, she's having this great business about an election campaign at the moment. Something so rather going yes. on at the moment. She's working very hard, yes, so rushing out. While I'm still. What school did you go to? I went to a place called Sedberg in Yorkshire. Good school? Well, I hated it, personally. But is it, it a good school? I suppose it was all right. Its motto was a hard nurse of men, and they sent us out on the mountains in the winter with no clothes on, virtually, in order to get hardened up. And I thought that... This British Spartan That's it. masochism. Well, I don't know about masculine. It's so hard. I, I, I never worry about the cold now, which is some advantage. Yeah. Mind you, in Britain, it's just as soft as we are now. I'm just stalling for time, you know. Not really. I would take you up on that one, however. Yes, you're as soft our as we are now. Our central heating has always kept a lower temperature than yours. Oh, yes. One of my friends had to buy a house the other day in London, in Lambeth. Yeah. What a price. Oh, it's terrible, yeah. It's like Coronation Street with a basement. Yeah, well, you look at here. I was out, my brother's got a little house up in Lacana Crescent. There's an empty plot of ground near there. 46 feet by 136. And what do they want for it? $200,000. Bloody nonsense. It's ridiculous. And a little house in his road where the houses were selling 20 years ago at about $25,000 is on the market at 450. 
Where does it end? Where does it indeed? Uh? Mind you, it's our immigration pressure with lots of big money coming into the country, which I think does force up the prices. I think that applies as far as BC is concerned. We've got a, a tremendously attractive I mean, area. Houses in Ottawa are only half the price of what they're asking yes, here now. Yes. Is that not so? About that, yes. I don't know how well we're getting on with our stall with the BC Tel. We're on hold. We'll forget it for the moment and stand by. Now, I was going to say something else to you. I had one kind of frightening experience in Britain. I was driving with a young off-duty police officer. And we're going through East End of London, or somewhere in the East End of London. Many colored black people around. Mm -hmm. And this young policeman said to me, and I nearly fell out my chair, my seat, what this country needs is a nitla. 28 years of age, had been involved in great difficulties before he transferred to the country, okay. and was faced with a situation whereby he didn't know Hitler's background, he didn't know what Hitler did, he just mm -hmm. knew that Hitler meant law and order. Uh, is the race trouble really quite serious in Britain? Well, I had a taxi driver in London the la last time I was there who said rather the same thing, but I do think that this is a very small minority of people I, I do not sense in any way that there is any move to the extreme right of that kind. But you fact, can see how, how unhappy I, the I, police are. There are no doubt at all in certain areas where you have a, a large color problem uh, and where you have friction between the local white community. And there are people who do bandy words about in that sort of way without uh, thinking at all about it. But I do not think in any way they represent uh, the country and uh, I, I do not see any sign at all that over the country as a whole the forces of intolerance are on the, on the increase. I, I was there at the time of the inquiry into the conduct of the special police group. Uh, that was also at the time, I believe, the National Front had been holding a parade and somebody was killed, mm -hmm. but they never could find who well did the, well did the baton. I remember, yes, that one. Now, I think, I mean, what is here? I mean, I was walking down on your beach and went into a... Mm -hmm. And carry on. One of those block houses there are just down here, and I, I noticed a Nazi scrawl on the side True. of the wall there. There's that small fringe. Will you area. forgive me for yeah, a please, moment? Yeah. What line are we on? Mr. McFarlane. Good morning, Jack. Good morning again. Second time I've called you. I'm able to tell you from Bill Clark of the Telephone Workers Union that if you can be good enough to give a guarantee that these boys will not have any action against them and can have their jobs back when the dispute is over, they will come out now. That's from Bill Clark through me to you. Well, it's, And there uh, is a straight proposition. If, if you can say, uh, understand that these two boys have got themselves in a jackpot, perhaps through some misguided enthusiasm or misunderstandings about negotiation breakdown, they and can say, okay, they've learned a lesson, they will come out now if you will guarantee their jobs when the strike is over. No action against them. How's that for a quick settlement? <laughs> well, uh, first off, I need to know, of course, uh, just uh, what is the extent of the, uh, of the action that they've taken. I know that they did uh, uh, take action in the office there. I, I need to know whether there is anything, uh, you know, serious damage or whether no, they've done anything. Uh, Bill told me, I'm almost sure, uh, that there is no damage and that they can come out now and leave the place ship shape and Bristol fashion, no problem at all. If you will say, okay, out and no damage, uh, on the condition no damage has been done, it's left as is. If you will say they can have their jobs back when the dispute is over. I think it's a very significant thing that uh, Bill Clark phoned me off the air and I said, you want this under the table or on top of the table? What's that effect? And he said, deal with it as you wish. And I know it was Bill Clark I was speaking to and he's obviously as concerned as you are and I think it would be the, the, uh, the gracious gesture subject to the fact that there is no damage and that they come out now regard it as an unfortunate incident and over and nobody loses too yeah. much faith. The only problem I have, uh, Jack, uh, is that I'm pretty sure from what I've been told that these fellows don't necessarily know what they have done. No. Well, it's yeah. obvious that what they have done is not anything in the way of physical damage that couldn't be put right in a few moments. Yeah. Look, I, it, it sounds encouraging to me. 
I just want to make a quick check and then I'll get back to you. What's your Would number you there? phone me back? Uh, Anton will give you the number off the air so you can get back to me direct. But I think you can take that as gospel from Bill Clark that no damage has been done, that they've obviously said, prevailed upon the, the two men not to do anything, and they will come out if you will just say, okay, if there's no damage and they come out, fine. Job's back after the strike. After I understand the, what you're saying. Okay, if you can get back at me quickly, I'd be very grateful. Will do. Thank you. I'll take a break. We should hear shortly from Gordon McFarlane on that particular end to this unhappy little affair in Prince George. So, John. Uh, let's tackle the Constitution. Do you think there is any possibility that a handful of backbenchers might move in some way to block the return of the BNA Act and a unilateral action by Pierre Trudeau? I was, when I joined the Foreign Office, uh, one of the first things they said to me was, my boy, when you're dealing with the media and the television, never answer a hypothetical question. Well, your question is really a hypothetical one at the moment because the question of the resolution for the Patriotic Constitution is still before your own Parliament. Excuse me a second. One, two, four, four. Who? Mr. McFarlane. Hello again, Jack. Yes, hello again. Okay, uh, in the, the couple of minutes that I've had to, to just check this thing out, uh, on the clear understanding that there is no damage done in the office, if the Union can get these fellows out, uh, then fine, uh, I will agree that we take no action as you just outlined to me. Okay. Now, uh, I should caution you, though, that I have not spoken to Prince George. I couldn't get them in that short time that I had. And uh, so I can't be sure that our people haven't already done something to get these people out. I don't think so. That's why Bill Clark, who must be watching now. Assuming, assuming that our people up there haven't taken any action, and I'm I'm trying to get a call through to tell them to stop any action if they've got it, if they've, if they've taken it. Mm -hmm. Assuming they haven't, then fine. Provided we find out when these fellows come out, we check and, and ensure that there is no damage done, then there'll be no action taken against them. Okay. If there is damage, then obviously we, uh, that doesn't hold. Now, okay, let me repeat that to you. You have not been able to get through to Prince George, but on the assumption that there is no, act, that there is no damage whatsoever to the rack room, or its equipment, or premises, or adjoining, whatever. And when this is checked, perhaps by yourself and an official of the union, or by yourself, I mean, you would know this. fine with me. If, if yourself and an official of the union, you will withdraw and not take any action against these two uh, telephone workers who moved in last night at 9 o'clock. For, yeah, for this issue, you know. For on, on this issue, on this right, particular yeah, if point. If do something else, then they're going to... Yes, in other words, it's quite clear that I got the message from Clark, I gave the message to you. The message from me was that Bill Clark said that he thinks quite confident he could get these fellows out, that no damage has been done, providing you said they would have their jobs back uh, after the dispute. They must be out at the moment. And you have said you haven't been able to get through to Prince George, but assuming that there is no action, that everything is... 100% in the order that they went in and that there are no booby traps and whatnot which have done any damage and I don't believe there are and if action hasn't already been started to remove them in some other way you say yes if everything is clean and copacetic yep. no action against the uh, man. One question for you when you <laughs> when you say dispute uh, I take it you mean this dispute this situation in Prince George. Yes. Right because you know I, I don't know what these fellows might Fine. Be. Bill Clark is watching I'm quite sure and I'll report back on the air as soon as I speak to Bill Clark. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Clark's calling Prince George right now. He's at the moment. Did Clark hear that? Clark, I told him about it. He said an amnesty, good. I told him the details. Anton is telling me. Come over onto the camera, Anton. Just come in beside me and let's see. Yeah. We'll do a two shot. Just talk to Bill Clark, Jack. And he's the president of the Telephone Union. The Telecommunication Workers Union. He said he's calling Prince George right now. I told him the details. I said an amnesty if there's no damage. And he said, great, I've got a call right now because... I guess he's afraid. He's afraid that um, that at this very moment, uh, this, he said they heard somebody maybe climbing up a cable duct bank 
and trying to get into the room. So if they can stop that. Well, I know. We also know something else, that the two men, uh, Gordon and Massey, were also watching the television from within. They have a television monitor of some kind in there. So presumably everything will be suspended until this particular amnesty deal is made copacetic. Thank you very much, Anton Koscheny. And you'll keep me in touch, and we'll put Bill Clark on the air as soon as we get him. So, John, I got to apologize. No, I don't have to apologize to you. It's, uh, I'm much impressed of this evidence of uh, the role of diplomacy that you, Jack, are playing. And I wish I could conduct my negotiations successfully, as you apparently We did. haven't done it yet. Count no chickens until they're hatched, Sir John. But you see, people think I'm a really a horrible person. I'm not. I'm a very nice guy. Where's well, all this reputation you've got? That's what do I do now? How can you go back to a straight conversation? Well, you were telling me, you asked me about the uh, constitutional, oh, constitutional thing. Yeah. That's right. And yeah. I was just saying that I never answer hypothetical questions, and your question was a hypothetical one, because the Constitution of Proposals at the moment before the Canadian Parliament. It'd be quite wrong for me to comment on what your own parliamentary people are at the moment commenting on in great vigour. Yeah. In fact, the well, I can ask you this question, though. Would uh, the British Parliament or the average, well, you're hardly an average Briton, Englishman, but would you be in the least concerned that the Constitution comes back to Canada? I think Great Britain would have been delighted had in 1931 you agreed to have it back. Well, the last thing we want is to have your constitution in England. That's a little nag. You were saying uh, that we would be delighted had you then had it back. It's a, it's a pain in the neck to us. It's only a technical tie to the court strings of the mother of it, Parliament. It's, no, yes, it's, uh, purely. I suppose it is. Well, Sir John, how, how am I doing for time? Got two minutes to go. That was, uh, you're always good fun, I must tell you that. Well, I'm delighted. If I come back again next spring, I shall be retiring next uh, summer in 55? June. Fifty-five? Retiring no, at fifty-five? Sixty. 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 Yeah. Like and the beginning of June, so I'll pay a last farewell call to the British sure. Columbia, God willing, in and April. And if the if the thing keeps going, if the cost of living keeps going in Britain, your pension will double in six years. Maybe I may come out to British Columbia if the rate of exchange continues to go in our well, favour. No, I don't know if you qualify. You're over sixty. Yeah, relatives, so. Oh, no, no, I, I don't think you qualify. Well, I might be able to contribute to your economy. I hope I would. I have to be some honest... Oh, for that matter, you could stay in Ottawa and defect. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> Ask for political <laughs> asylum. My, no, th I, my thanks to you, Sir John. I'm sorry we got messed around a little bit, but as usual, you were a veritable mine of information. I'm glad you admitted this thing about the fiddle British economy. The fiddle. Much obliged. Webster, after the break. Very shortly, I plan to interview Michelle Smith and Dr. Lawrence Pazder, MD, but it's such a sensitive type interview that I'm not really very keen on interrupting the interview with phone calls about the telephone situation in Prince George, as I was able to do with, uh, Dr. with uh, Sir John Ford. So I'm going to take a considered gamble, and uh, I'm going to take your telephone calls for seven or eight minutes in the sure set and faith that Bill Clark of the Telephone Workers Union will get back to me on the situation in Prince George, then I can start the interview clean with uh, Dr. Pazder and Michelle Smith. I'll try it for a few minutes anyway. So what have we done this morning? Well, we've done the telephone company thing. That's really quite good. And I spoke to, to Sir John about the, the black money market. It doesn't mean blacks. He means the fiddled money market in Britain, which seems to be the secret of some particular success of people to survive in the horrendous cost of living uh, which exists in Britain today. I was glad to get the phone call. Giselle, of course, phoned the, the workers and the two guys in the rack room and got their statement. That started the ball rolling. And then I got hold of Gordon McFarlane, who was properly perturbed, and then Anton got hold of Bill Clark, and Bill Clark phoned back and suggested this compromise settlement. Get the picture of these two fellows, Percy Gordon and P Peter Massey, I've got the names wrong. Messrs. Massey and Gordon moved into the rack room in Prince George last night at 9 o'clock with some food and supplies and facilities to last for a while. But nice to see it over and done with without any unnecessary furors over what may well have been a misguided action. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yes, yes. Yes, I have a comment about the um, 
present civic election uh, about the stadium issue. I've listened to both sides, and Volrich and Zlotnick, everybody seems very, very anxious to spend our money on stadiums. As I understand it, a stadium is a place where professional teams play sports. Professional teams are basically uh, a business. I haven't had any offers from Zlotnick or Volrich to build offices for me to carry on my business. I'm not sure why, uh, no explanation has been given, why they're so anxious to spend my money to subsidize other businessmen. I think that's a very sound comment. I don't see anything wrong with it, except that in 1980, governments, as in the case of Robson Square, take it upon themselves to build the monoliths, and monuments, and museums, such as Prince, such as uh, the Robson Square. Yes, but there's no admission to Robson Square, and Robson Square isn't built for a specific industry, a professional sports industry. It's built for the free use of the public. The skating well, rink is free, for example. The I'll give you the, the volrich Zlotnick line, and of course I believe the Harcourt line too, is that a uh, hundred million dollar stadium with so many 55,000 seats containing baseball and whatnot is such an attraction to the economic health of the city that it's well worth the public involvement in spending all this money because of the continuing, like the Pacific uh, Waterfront Convention Center. As I understand it, it's going to benefit the hotels and it's going to benefit uh, the football and baseball team. And the tourist industry and the restaurants. Let the people who who uh, are going to benefit from it, let, Hil let Messrs. Hilton and let the CPR get together and put the money up and, uh, and pay for the cost. Or let's find a company to donate it. In Toronto, for example, there's the O'Keeffe Centre, which was donated gratis by the O'Keeffe Brewing Company for the advertising. I, I don't think you have a very valid point, so you've got nobody to vote for in the civic elections. Uh, unfortunately not. And the other question I, I have is, looking at the ridiculous price they're paying the CPR, I think uh, in legal terms that land might come back to them for nothing. Uh, the CPR made a deal. It got the land in return for running a railroad. And the deal was you get $25 million and 25 million acres of land to subsidize the losses of running a railway. You watched the establishment last night, didn't you? Uh, no, this has been something I, I read a number of years ago as well. Um, the CPR seems to want to talk about the fact that it can't run a railway for the losses, but it, uh, I, it seems they want to call the deal off. They don't want to run the railway anymore, and I think the other half of the deal is, fine, don't run the whale, railway. We're sorry you don't like the deal. We'll mm. let you out of it. You take the railway back and give us the land back. Fair enough, boy, but you won't win it, but I like your attitude. Go ahead, please. Hello. Good morning, and Prince George. Yeah, good morning. Uh, did you know that um, Premier Bennett is on one of your local radio stations this morning? I'm heartbroken. <laughs> I thought you might be. Well, anyway, I just thought you might like to know that... Uh, oh, I love these people who point Constitution again. I had no need for Premier Bennett on this morning. When I want Premier Bennett on is the morning after the budget if, if there is a natural gas tax imposed. That's when I want him on. Oh, really? That's the next issue. No Co kidding. It's a big one, too. That's the big one. That's the big one. We'll know that on the morning of the 20, night of the 28th and the morning of the 29th. And we'll hopefully have Premier Bennett on telling us what he thinks of the federal budget. Good. That's, That's the important all I want to hear. One. I hate these people who tell you about other programs, even if they are only radio. Go ahead, please. I'm surprised that you're backing the situation of the workers in Prince George. Not backing them. I'm negotiating. These people work for a, a particular company. They have a duty to the people in the Prince George area for them to d take off the phones. Uh, they're against the people in Prince George. There's no reason in the world why they're working for uh, a company of the size of BC Tell that they should take the law into their own hands. As far as I'm concerned, I'm surprised that McFarlane, he should immediately fire them. That's right, sir, thank you. And I'm not cutting you off. I've got to take a break for another reason. You think they should be fired immediately. Right. The, the union and Mr. McFarlane are presumably trying to find something short of another piece of abrasiveness. Webster, I'm, I'm, off, I'm off the air now. Take a break. Take a break. <laughs> As soon as anything happens in the telephone company situation in Prince George, hopefully we'll let you know before 10.30, but I must now carry on with my scheduled interview. It's a book, and it's a book called Michelle Remembers. And it's about this delightful young lady, Michelle Smith, who is sitting here, 
with one of her doctors, Dr. Lawrence Pazder, who has written this book. Jack? I got Bill Clark on 351. To go on air? Oh, I shouldn't have. Uh, no, uh, okay. Well, I'm off the air, but right. your voice can't be heard. I'm on the air, but you're not off the air. Are you there, Bill? The Mr. McFarlane is quite clear, and obviously I think he's quite right, but they've got to go back to work to their assigned places, which are... Uh-huh. Well, I might as well put you on the air, Bill. Hold on. I'll start my interview again in a moment. On the telephone now is Bill Clark of the Telephone Workers Union, and I relayed as faithfully as I could your message to Gordon McFarlane, and Gordon McFarlane was hesitant, but I said there had been no damage, no da damage done, and the condition was that there'd be no action taken against these men and that they would get their jobs back after the strike, and he agreed to that. Now, what's this kit salt complication? Well, well, Jack, that's what we're talking about ap after the strike. These guys have been on strike uh, for two weeks up at, uh, they haven't been on the job at Kitzel for, for some two weeks now. Somebody's got another phone open. Close that other phone. How many phones have you got on? You're still there, haven't you, Gordon? Hey, Bill? 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 We lost him. Dash. Will you accept my apologies? Yes, of course. This is a very <laughs> tricky situation for me to do indeed. And I don't want to botch up the interview with you because it's a very tricky interview and I want to give it a good examination. Let me put it this way. There would seem to be some complication in what looked like a... Did you say they're outside now? Is that Bill again? We'll see if we can get over again when we're cut off. Well, report along with Webster. Negotiate along with Webster. Live television. Bill. Yeah. Oh, here we are again. We're cut off. Yeah. I think we may have been at our end. Yeah. Are the men outside now? Yes, we told them to. Uh, we told them that the company was really concerned and to get out of there within three minutes or so. And they got out. Yeah, that's all done. Well, is that not really over and done with now, and that if their reassignment will take place in the normal fashion for anybody else affected in the same way by the same situation? Well, no. There's about. Uh, Geez, I forget the numbers, Jack. There must be 28 guys all together off the job at Kitsault. These but two guys can't go back there. Well, if they weren't working at Kitsault, what's the difference now if they're not working at Prince George? They're off the job. They, they, these guys were, uh, were off the job when all this happened. You mean they, the work, they'd been laid off temporarily? Well, no. We've had about 530 or 40... That's correct. The other two of the men who, who under this union strategy who were not working. Is that right? That's right. But now what do you expect? They're out, no action is going to be taken against them. So well, well, that was the way that, uh, that, was the way that we, uh, we worded it to you and Mr. McFarland. Yeah, and Mr. McFarland said no action will be taken against them, but I if they're off work at Kitsault, they presumably will still be off work at Kitsault. That's right. And when, we sign it, and when we finally sign a collective agreement, they go back the same as everybody else. That was the deal. Is that not what the understanding is? Well, no, I understand now that Mr. McFarland has said, and, uh, and perhaps we shouldn't say this on the air in case there's a misunderstanding, but I, I understand as well now say that on after the we've made the deal, mm -hmm. that Mr. McFarland now says, well, yes, we'll give them amnesty as long as they go back to work at Kitzel. Well, we can't oh, say no, 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 uh, Let's get Mr. McFarland on the telephone right now. We'll open two keys and two people can talk, because I know my old general tell and tell equipment, which I've got in my desk, can handle two calls if I open two keys at the same time. I'm quite sure of it, uh, because, well, logically to me, the fact is that they're off work at Kitsault, they're out of the place, and they'll still be off work at Kitsault. Is that your understanding? Yes, that's my understanding. Well, if that's the situation, you're quite happy. Yes. Not happy, but in well, the circumstances. Over, everybody, we all go back to work under the same terms, and that... I would say it's the same terms. Goodness gracious me, why don't I keep my big nose out of these things? Although I still think we're all right, Bill. Yeah? Yes, say... Uh, <laughs> I'm laughing, Bill. I'm just uh, a little hysterical at the moment, that's all. But that, that would be my understanding, too, I think. Now, I, have we got Mr. McFarlane? 1244 is there. 1244 is there. Is he there? 
Is anybody on one, two, four, four? Well, you better warn them first before I put them on there. Ask him if he would mind going on there right now with, with Bill Clark. I'm going to try that. You hold that. You keep your, you keep one two four four open just in case. Go. No, they won't stay open. <laughs> Mr. McFarlane. Yes, Jack. Just one little thing about the kit salt complication. Yes. If these men are now out, they were ordered out by the union, and they came out in a matter of three minutes. Correct? They are out. Are they? They, they are out. I see. Okay. You know something I don't. I have. I've been in a meeting. No, Clark is out, and the kit salt complication is this that um, they are now out, so therefore they will be in the same position as they were in before and will go back to work when the contract is eventually signed. They are one of the 28 men or so who are off at Kitsalt, correct? One of the men who are out of Kitsalt. Out yes. of Kitsalt. So now they go back to day one and they're still out at Kitsalt. That's your agreement, isn't it? Yes. Well, that's fine. There's no complication. Well, no, just Hold on. Don't go away. Uh, clock's on 351. Did you hear that, Day Bill? Is he saying that they're still out at Kitsalt the same as everybody else? Well, yeah, hold on a second. And is that satisfactory to you, Bill? Yes. Is that satisfactory to you, providing the status quo, the return to the status quo immediately? Yes. Hold on. Did you hear that, Gordon? Return to the... I heard it, but look, I was just getting a note put in front of me uh, confirming that they have left the building. Now, uh, here's the situation, Jack, is if those men want to go back to work in Kitsalt, we will send them back to work in Kitsalt. If they don't want to go back at work, so be it. They won't go back to work. Oh, just hold on a second. Do you agree with that? Yeah, that's, that's the way we understood it. Okay, hold on. He understands that, and apparently they're, they're outside now, and there's apparently no damage done. Uh -huh. How's that, Gordon? Okay, great. Do we have a settlement? Hold on. Do we have... Yes. We have... Okay. Any other quibbles? Uh, Bill. Yes. Bill Clark. They're out, back to the status quo. They're in the same position that the other workers at, at uh, Kitsalt. When the contract is eventually signed, no action will be taken against them for this unfortunate incident. Clear? Yeah, that's clear, and thanks very much. Okay. Is that clear, Mr. McFarlane? Yeah, this incident being the Prince George incident. Prince George incident in the rack room and no damage done. Yep, okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. And thank me, too. Good. Thank you very much, Bill. Okay, Mr. Webster. All of them done with, and there was no damage done in the room, I gather. <sighs> we started with uh, at nine o'clock this morning, and by eight minutes past ten, we have diffused what could have been a somewhat explosive situation. Thank you very much. Now I can take my break and start my interview properly. <laughs> The book is called Michelle Remembers. The authors are Michelle Smith and Lawrence Paz, their MD, who, acting as a psychiatrist, distracted from her bizarre childhood memories of Satan, which have shocked many people. And this may or may not affect your religious sensibilities as to whether or not you believe in Satan as a real live evil spirit, just as live as those who believe in the presence of God. And I think perhaps we best start this by going to Dr. Pazda and asking him, how come you wrote this book? Tell me about Michelle and what, in fact, you believe happened to her as a small child. Well, we have to back up a little bit. I knew Michelle very well through four years of therapy, uh, intensive therapy, and there was no evidence of any of this kind of material present, but I knew her personality and everything. When she came to me a year after it had been discontinued and went into a very deep level of consciousness and began to relive, essentially, to see, to hear, to feel, and to tell me in detail these events for 14 months of what happened to her as a child, uh, it was very difficult for me to decide where it was coming from. I looked to see, was it imagination, was it hysteria? Where was it coming from? Was it psychosis? I have to say that the evidence is clear that this came from an experience that Michelle had. There has been nothing that I've been able to unearth that says it didn't. 
And there are many things pointing to the fact that, in fact, it did. And it challenges where psychiatry is, where our beliefs are, uh, how we work with people. It brings many new horizons, but particularly, it's a story of hope. This was not done under hypnosis? Not under hypnosis. What was Michelle's condition at the beginning of the four years of therapy? I think her condition was one of having insight into knowing that some of the earlier experiences she had that she was aware of needed to be listened to and worked through. She wasn't suffering from an inability to function in any sense. She had been going to university, had realized that she should look at some of the issues in her early background and resolve those. And those were done very carefully. Now, you mentioned evidence which proved some of the early things you feel that happened to her as a small child in Victoria, B.C. That's right. Michelle, can I ask you mm -hmm. what it was that after four years of therapy and this deep state of consciousness that came out of your mind? Uh, basically, what I remembered was a 14-month period of my life at age five where I was given to a group of people whom at first I wasn't aware of what they were doing other than to a child. They were adults doing things I couldn't understand and that frightened me. About three months, three and a half months into the remembering, I realized through the ritual and repetition that these people had that they were involved in some type of satanic church or worship. You were then how old? Five years old. Had this disturbed you before you went into no, therapy? No, I had no memory of this whatsoever before After that time. therapy, you began to be very disturbed by what was deep in your subconscious. I had left the four years of therapy with Dr. Pastor, feeling that I'd basically resolved the issues in my life that I needed to and was going on with my life very happily. Uh, when I began to feel, about a year and a half later, an increasing pressure that said there was something there that I needed to tell him, but I didn't know what it was at what the time. What was it? Tell me. Tell me as much as you can, tell me. What basically came out of that yes. pressure was, uh, the first thing I remembered was a night when a group of people were gathered to do, I didn't know what, they were doing dances that were not like the dances I was used to. They had the walls draped in black, they had set up candles, uh, that kind of thing. And basically what I remembered is quite a struggle that very early got set up between myself and them in that they somehow wanted me to participate in something that I as a child couldn't comprehend. Did you have a mother and father yes. there? Yes. No, no. my mother was present but not in the ceremony, not in the ritual. She wasn't involved in that. Her position seemed to be one of giving me to this group. What kind of group would you describe it as? A satanic group? You yes. Said. You mean a coven of witches? I don't know if you'd call them witches. They were certainly dedicated to doing a lot of seriously frightening and destructive were things. Were you molested or injured or tortured yes, I was, in some way? I was way? physically hurt a lot. At one point, uh, because of the lack of cooperation that I exhibited, they placed me in a car and literally drove it over the side of a cliff with me in it. I survived that car accident. How old were you then? I was five years old. And what do you think was the end result of these ceremonial tortures that you went through? I think basically they somehow wanted me to become a part of whatever it was they were involved in. They somehow wanted me to be taken over by, by, their, by their belief system. Um, but it's funny, children are very simplistic. They're very literal. And very early to a child, things are black and white, good and bad. Did you recall uh, anything about animal or human sacrifices? They, they sacrificed animals. And they used fetuses of babies in their ceremonies. Were you, what's the word, how does one put this satanic thing to Michelle? Well, this is difficult because... Um, oh, by the way, are you a Catholic? I've been practicing Catholic for the last three years. Are you a Catholic? I was raised Catholic. Raised yes. Catholic. How would you describe what was I want to ask you about the proof later, but how would you describe what was done mentally and physically? It was a very carefully organized assault on Michelle, on a physical, emotional, intellectual, and finally on a spiritual level. Very organized, very sophisticated, not helter-skelter, uh, a little bit of ceremony, a little of this. It was a very carefully carried out ritual. Uh, the full details of that are in some million and a half words of the transcript. They knew what they were doing. They're not to be confused with the White Witches and the groups that have formed since uh, uh, small, uh, like the... Who are these people? Well, they're a secret organization. They're a secret society. 
Uh, a secret society does not reveal the identity of the people or the ways of their practices. I was familiar with this type of society firsthand in Africa, practicing general medicine there. And if one of the members of that society revealed who he was, he was killed instantly. Are you suggesting that, that her body was taken over by the devil? No. They attempted to try to do that type of thing. But what is essential to understand is that Michelle, as a five-year-old child, stood up against this. This is not the exorcist, which rips you off with fear and makes you feel some evil force can come into a room and take you over. I don't believe that. This is the story of a child holding on to what she believed was good inside herself, her innocence, and through that was able to stand up against all that these people could do, and through spiritual interventions was able to as well. What saved, I mean, you take a five-year-old child and put them through dark, satanic-type rituals, surely the goodness this will eventually drive them out the tree. But what we need to do is to understand that children do have an innocence. You know, there are many peoples in, people in Auschwitz, in Biafra, in Cambodia, who have survived very horrendous situations and are beautiful, creative people. We have a very victimized view in psychiatry that says if a child has a bad environment, a bad family, it's going to be destroyed. But children do have an innocence. We know how we have to pound them to make them behave, to make them do something. Five-year-old, according to the CP story from Victoria, Michelle is saved by the timely intervention of the Virgin Mary. What was that referring to? I think we should ask I Michelle. think I can explain yes, that to you. At one point in this experience, um, they had become very serious in their spiritual invocation of things. And at one point, I was literally being frightened to death. At that moment, when I think I was dying, a very soft white light came and enveloped me, much like the feeling of being padded with cotton batten. And out of that, a woman came and stood beside me and took a hold of my hand, identified herself as my mare, and basically told me to hang on, to help me understand the situation I was in and how to get through it. My mare? My mare. The Virgin Mary? That's right. How old were you when you had the vision? Five years old. I didn't know who that was at five. All I knew was this was the first person that had come along in 10 months of my life who cared about me as a person and who wanted me to survive, not to destroy me. Some, somebody didn't feed and clothe you at the time, but used you yep. as a centerpiece of satanic invocation. That's right. Invading your body as well as your mind. That's right. Incredible story. So you believe every word of it. Well, I didn't fall over and believe it when it first came. I was very careful listening very careful, questioning right through the last of the 14 months. Now, yes, I do believe that this did, in fact, happen to Michelle. Would this book be attractive particularly to religious people? Would other people look at it and say, oi, hey, or look at it and say, oi? I think know. it's attractive to many levels. It asks us to reach beyond at a psychological level to the, some of the ways we look at people very narrowly as walking heads and analyze it and to a more encompassing view of man. I think it's attractive to the religious people and to people who are interested just in life. We're not telling people they have to believe this. I think that would take their freedom away. We're saying this is the experience Michelle related to me in detail. This is what I have done as a psychiatrist. I'm not an investigative reporter, but as a psychiatrist, what I did convinced me that this was, in fact, a reality for Michelle. Yeah. Uh, people can pick that up and take their own journey with it and see what they conclude. That's very important. I didn't take Michelle's freedom away when she came to me. I said, go where you need to and follow it. I think people who read that should have the same freedom. Well, more questions for Dr. Lawrence Pasder and for Michelle Smith on Michelle Remembers after the break. <music> Michelle Remembers horrifying experiences at the age of five which were extracted from her later after four years of therapy by, and a deep consciousness remembrance with Dr. Lawrence Pastor. The book's already a big bestseller. Did you realize that? No. You wrote it, you wrote it. We wrote it, we together. wrote it together. And tell me, what proof is there? Well, it goes back to your early memories, which you didn't achieve. Your memory didn't come back till what age? 27. 27, right. so that's 22 years between. That's right. Were you able to back, to check, back check any incidents? Well, it was difficult to get hospital records and so on. They've all been destroyed. I tried hard with that, but I did talk to her pediatrician who remembers the car accident, uh, remembers how Michelle was treated without him having any of the information. You mean she was badly treated by, to his knowledge at that time? How she was treated in the, in the car, how she suffered a car accident and the smoke inhalation. Had you remembered this car accident at all? No. All of this was buried past what we call the unconscious into a very deep place and there was even no evidence of it in the four years I worked with her at all. 
I mean, if it was hypnotic regression, I'd be suspicious. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It comes from maybe what Jungians call the base of the psyche. It's a very difficult, but there's a mystery in it that isn't all explained simply by what I know as a psychiatrist or a scientist. And you're a conventional medical psychiatrist. Absolutely. Michelle, why did you write the book? That was a question I wrestled with for about two months. Do I just sit back in Victoria with what I know, which would have been the easier for me as a person, but with the responsibility of the kind of information that I had out of this experience, I knew that it needed to be shared, and then I had to decide, do I share it just with religion or do I share it just with psychiatry? But those areas are studying it anyway. It's the average person that with this kind of information, as Dr. Pastor said, to me, whether anybody believes it isn't what's important. To me, the importance is in sharing the information so that maybe we can make some wiser decisions about the kinds of things that go on. Maybe we won't get so easily pulled into cults. Maybe we won't dismiss a child brought into an emergency ward with the kinds of abuse that I suffered. Maybe we won't just dismiss that as a child abuse case, that we will see them at the hands of these people. But more than that, I made a promise to this person who came, a mayor, that I would share this with as many people Mama, as I could. The Virgin Mary. So I'm keeping a childhood you, promise. Do you remember that now she said to you? All that I'd seen and heard would I remember exactly. You would remember exactly all. You were never, do you believe it was possible for you to have in fact been possessed by the devil? No, no. But I these? fought very strongly against that and in no way do I ever have experienced any of the negative things. Do you know who these people now are? That was, that was 25 years ago, and they were often in ceremony in the dark. It's not a witch hunt anyway. It's merely to let people know that in the incidences where it does happen, not to make everyone paranoid. What do you remember of, a animal, of an animal sacrifice? What do I? Remember. An animal was sacrificed in they front would, of They you? would sacrifice kittens and things like that. And smear you with? With that. The but body. To a, to a small child, you see, in order to survive that, you said at one point that would drive people crazy. Mm. But a small child, the kinds of things that they do in a situation like that is, for instance, they put me in a cage at one point. Instead of seeing that as a place that trapped me, I saw it as a place that protected me from these people I was afraid of. And inside that little space, I could create my own world. So those you were are the saying that there are some psychic or psychiatric or clerical investigations. Well, certainly of there's the a, a careful uh, investigation being conducted by the church. Very careful, very serious. All the material is in their hands. I know the book's a big success already. Mm. Right. Michelle. Well, I think people really are, are anxious to hear triumph today, not just horror. My apologies for a kind of chopped up interview. My thanks to Dr. Lawrence Pazner from Victoria, big bestseller, Michelle remembers, and to Michelle Smith herself. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Dr. Pazner. I'll be back after the break. Peter Massey and David Gordon, the two telephone company employees who occupied the rack room at Prince George, left there at 10 past 10 this morning, back to normal, due to on-air negotiations on this program between Gordon McFarlane and Bill Clark of the Telephone Workers Union. Tomorrow, 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs>